Next step. You have mastered this sequence and your logic works correctly. You've duplicated with the sequencer output instruction what you did with all of those rungs that are still in ladder six. The next step is we've enhanced our sequencer form to make it complete. This is really what they look like back in, in the day. So we've already done the output section. I call it addressing. You could call it memory locations. Really, the instructions address memory locations. So you are addressing output word 0, bit 0, bit 1, bit 2, bit 3. In your input instructions, your read instructions, you are addressing them to read the input word 0, bit 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now, I have um, you divided up into two groups. Notice I have a blue box around 0, 1, 2, and an orange box around 3, 4, 5. That's because I, not cleverly, I just happened to do it, divided it up into machine position and product presence. So in the blue box, those are inputs that recognize machine position, like proc switches that recognize that a cylinder is extended, and then in the orange box, product presence, photo eyes that see products in certain positions. More or less, that's the way we've divided it up. Now, what we had you do in this step is, for step zero, with all the outputs off, what state would the in, what state should the inputs be in as a result of all the outputs off in step zero? So you look at step zero, you see all the outputs are off. You go back to your diagram for the process in your manual, and you don't say, okay, if all the outputs are off, all the cylinders are retracted, and we'll say that there's more or less no product on the conveyor. Okay then you go in and put in one if the sensor would be on, zero if it would be off. Now one one little uh, nuance here to consider is that in order to go to step one uh, we need to show product presence. So keep that in mind. You see in step one for the outputs it says cylinders one and two extended. Well we don't extend them until the photo eye sees the part there in front of cylinder two. So uh, you'll have to add that in at some point, the product recognition, which it requires to go to the next step. So that's all you do here, was you went in uh, and changed the zeros to ones that represented the result of the motion caused by the outputs that were energized in the same state. This logic you added, and we're going to eventually compare, no pun intended, this to the sequencer compare instruction. Basically, it's looking for a bit pattern to match what you have said needs to be matched to go to the next step. So if you look up at the first rung there, uh, we have the found a bit, B330 slash 1, a one shot rising because we remember we need a one shot to prevent the add instruction. Now in this case this might work without it, but don't try it. The one shot is to prevent the add from continuing to add every program scan as long as the found bit is true. Now, so you're incrementing N799 which would be like the position word in a, a control data type. The second rung, just like what you have in ladder six, is basically the reset. So we're saying if you get to six, that means you've gone through six steps, zero through five. And when it increments to six, that's one passed. So you clear N799 and you're back to step zero. And then in the next rung, we're saying if you're in step zero, and B311 matches the input bit pattern, because you're only looking at the first six bits. Okay, 
you're comparing the first six bits of B311 to the input word. And as long as you're in step zero, meaning as long as N799 is equal to zero, it's just going to stay there until the equal instruction is true. In other words, B311 matches the pattern of the input switches. That's going to turn on B330 slash 1. Next scan through, that's going to cause the add instruction and 1 0 to increment N799 by 1. Okay, so you go to rung 1, N799 is equal to 1, not 6, so that rung is false. You go to rung 2, the first ladder, N799 equal to 0, nope, N799 equal to 1, yep. Does B312 match the input pattern? Nope. Well, when it does, then B330 slash 1 will go on, basically for one program scan, because the next scan, B330 slash 1, through the one shot, increments N799 by 1, it's still not equal to 6, rung 2. It's not equal to 0, it's not equal to 1, it is equal to 2, so now it's waiting for the bit pattern in B313 to match the input pattern again. And this just does this continuously until you've gone through all six steps and then it resets back to zero. So here you have logic that increments every time it sees a bit pattern match. Really very simple logic. Um, and we're, we're going to compare this. Now we're ready to go a little further here. However, before we do that, I um, just want to remind you that what we did was we took a bit that's controlled in ladder file 8. Remember we called it the found bit, B330 slash 1. And we are we're going to substitute that bit for input 0. Originally when you did um, ladder 6, you had input 0 that you were incrementing the add instruction, N7100, which is your pointer or your position for your sequencer. We're going to substitute B330 slash 1, which is controlled by the results in ladder 8, for that switch. Now, we have three subroutines. Uh, ladder 7, or I should say JSR to 7, should be disabled. So B329 slash 1 should be off. 0 and 2 should be on. And we had you bring ladder 8 into view. Then sequence the inputs to match the pattern that you entered for each step while observing the output LEDs. So in other words, uh, you entered a bit pattern into B30, B31, B32, etc. It should all still be in there from the previous labs. Okay? Do the LED sequence in the same way that they did when you step the outputs through using input 0 to toggle the logic in step 6 from step to step? Yes. What replaced input 0 in ladder 6 to toggle the outputs to the next step? B330 slash 1 equal to the found bit. In other words, in ladder 8, you're doing a comparison. When it finds a match, the found bit turns on and says, OK, OK, step 0 complete. When it matches, the found bit comes on. OK, step 1 complete, step 2 complete, step 3 complete, and so on. Very simple. Now, you can use ladder logic for your sequencer. You don't have to use sequencer instructions. As a matter of fact, I would say that using ladder logic, as long as you are a good author and you take some responsibility for writing nice, clean code, that using ladder logic, straight ladder logic, for a sequence is easier to troubleshoot than using a sequencer instruction simply because in the sequencer instruction you can't see what's true. You can't see if the bit patterns match. You have no real feedback. So very few people actually use the sequencer instructions unless it's proprietary code. They really don't want the customer troubleshooting it. They don't want the customer changing it. If you're just looking at straight ladder logic, it's easy to edit because what you see is what you get. It's right in front of you. But if you have to go in and edit the bit pattern in a binary file, it's not as straightforward.
things got a little bit more complicated at this point. We had to go in and add a fourth, jump to subroutine rung in ladder two, and condition it with a Truifon B3293. Then we had you edit the rung in ladder seven and add any additional logic that was shown in the manual, as seen here. Being careful to use the same control element for both the sequencer compare and sequencer output instructions. Also, because a sequencer compare automatically increments to step one, if the rung is true when it resets, we will not use step zero. This means that you need to shift your bit patterns one word higher in memory. This is easy to do. You open B3, lock it on top, and then transfer the bit pattern from 5 to 6. That opens up 5, 4 to 5, and so on. In other words, you start with the empty spot and move the last one up. That way when you move 4 into 5, it leaves 4 as a duplicate of 5, and then you move 3 into 4, and so on, all the way down. And then 0, I would just clear it. Then, each of the rungs above would replace one of the rung files below. Although they are not identically functional in the smallest detail, it serves the purpose of acquainting you with how the two instructions, the sequencer compare and the sequencer output function. We have one more sequencer instruction, the sequencer load instruction, which um, is, is a nice little instruction. So once more, if you don't have it at this point, you need to go back to where you felt really comfortable, start over, and do this. You probably will get more out of the ladder logic sequencing than you did out of the sequencer instructions. But if you're maintenance engineers, maintenance technicians, maintenance electricians, you may inherit machines that use the SQO and the SQC instructions. So you don't have the benefit of writing it any way you like. You only have the benefit of understanding how the instructions work now that you've done this manual.